back to this and so on. My concern is the other way around. Okay. And as I was just saying, actually, I've always been the other way around because I started with an interest in interactive art, and that's when I worked out that I'd better be worried about human interaction because that was the biggest problem. In fact, um, this was the first paper I published. In fact, uh, my colleague Stroud Cornock and I presented this paper at a computer graphics conference in 1970 where we said the future, this is before PCs and stuff, by the way, uh, where we said the future was in, in art in relation to computers was to do with interaction. And we started developing uh, these models of different ways in which the audience and the artwork might relate to one another uh, and so on. And in fact, about the same time, I was remembering yesterday, I started to work on how people could interact with one another through an artwork. And I talked about that, the first talk I gave about that was in 1972 in Edinburgh. So here I am back again. But I don't think I'll repeat that talk because you might find that pretty boring. But to give you a, a flavour of that, there's something that many of you won't have seen before here, which is a picture, picture of a reel of paper tape, which used to be the user interface we used. Um, uh, and that's the kind of way we built interactive computer systems in those days. Although not everything was interactive, this was a work I made which was static work, but made with computers. Um, and I'm just showing you one or two things here because I want you to have a notion of where I'm coming from in relation to what I'm about to, to say. And also, I'm coming from an era when uh, the, the software was rather different to the software we use today. And most of the artists of my age group are what nowadays seem to be called software artists. That means we actually wrote the code. And still do, actually. And uh, that's interesting because there is a whole notion of interaction design and in interactive art built around things like uh, using Flash and so on, uh, which is a bit different in its orientation to the kind of work that we did and do where we write code at a slightly deeper level. Um, and I, I'm still, what I'm talking about in this uh, presentation is that, that approach, really. And we, you know, so here's a bit of, for, this is a bit of interactive art written with Fortran. Later on I use Prolog. Nowadays I tend to use uh, Max MSP or things like that. Um, here's an example of a piece of my work more recently in, on, the, on that screen there in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, so now I've moved my work into the street quite a lot. And I'm just going to show you a list now. It's my kind of final point of background. So I don't want you to think that I'm coming to this just from the point of view of, as an artist, what can I say to HCI people, but these are the sort of dates when I first published stuff about various things. And you'll see that human computer interaction, uh, iterative design methods, adaptable user interfaces, all that stuff is in there. So I'm also talking from that point of view. So I'm trying to cross these boundaries and try to show you something about how the two things come <coughs> together for the future. And just finally, a final point about myself, here's a piece of work on display as we speak. This is on the street in Sydney. This is um, that's a 15 metre long screen, the red the striped thing along there. But what's behind it is a building, <laughs> a lit building, and the striped thing is a, is a street art piece uh, uh, on show in a street gallery in Sydney, Australia at the moment. And that's the kind of stuff I do. But to come Towards the main point, I want to talk a little bit about human-computer interaction, a bit of history, because I want, again, to contextualise uh, my main point. Um, okay, I'm using the term human-computer interaction, and that's what I'm going to use. Of course, it's had many names, 
uh, man machine interface was the first term that I knew when I was starting this. People found that inappropriate later, and it became human computer interface. Then people realized that the interface wasn't really the point, it was the interaction, so it became human computer interaction. Depending which side of the Atlantic you were, maybe it was computer human interaction, and so on. Interaction design was the big thing. Experience design is pretty current today. Uh, there are lots of objections to that. Design for experience seems to be a better phrase for that, and so on and so forth. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm just going to say human computer interaction. Okay? That's and use whichever uh, synonym for that you wish uh, to understand what I'm saying. Um, there have been many transformations in HCI, and they continue, and this is my main point. Um, and I want to look to the future, what next? So far, as I see it, HCI has moved from a primar primary concern for ease of use, ease, easy to use, to a concern for enhancing creativity. Okay. And lots of other things, but here's the biggest thing. And that means a move from the kind of mechanics of it, coming out of ergonomics, really, to the experience of it by the user. So there's been a... Even though human-computer interaction introduced a concern for people into the whole computing world, nevertheless it started with a very sort of device-oriented approach and has been moving over these decades more and more into a people concern and what's happening with people, in people, and so on. Um, the easy-to-use idea was there really right from the beginning. I'm not going to read out these sort of quotes and things, but here we have a 1947 quotation where, in effect, the uh, how easy is it for the operator is mentioned as a major issue. So that's been there all along. And here are some key dates. Um, Brian Chappell, a colleague of mine when I was at Loughborough University, in fact, the man who persuaded me to go to Loughborough University, um, uh, unfortunately now deceased, but he wrote this paper in 1959, which really got it all going. Um, and so that goes back quite a long way, and it was based on, on physical ergonomics, really. That was the sort of starting point where people were more, more forward-looking, if you like, in terms of worrying about the human relationship to the machine. Um, Sketchpad in 63, the mouse was invented in 64. Alan Kay did his PhD, completed it in 1969, where he proposed something called Dynabook. We've now got it. It's called the iPad. Okay. Um, so he was way ahead of his time. In between, people thought that the laptop was what he dreamt of, but I don't actually think it was what he was dreaming of. I think he was dreaming of something much closer to the iPad than the than like this laptop that I'm using here. Xerox Park opened in 1970, where so much happened that is important to us today. And in 1976, a, a workshop was held, which was really the first CHI meeting. It wasn't a CHI meeting. I haven't been formed as a group, but that was really where human computer interaction on the American scene and in the ACM concept uh, of, of the world began. 1979, Steve Jobs visited Xerox Park, and that's where the real um, Windows-based user interface stuff coming into the marketplace began when he went back to the guys and said, that research thing we saw there, which cost a fortune, well, I want one of those that we can sell on the street. And which ended up as the Lisa, and then eventually the Mac. And then Kai itself started in 81. And it's interesting that at Kai in 1982, Tom Malone uh, wrote a paper where he advocated a concern for user engagement. I think he wasn't taken enough notice of. If you read that, that seems a much more modern kind of statement and concern uh, than the 1982 one. But so... There was a beginning of a move, and it took a long time. Everything seems to take a long time. You know, the 10-year rule, sometimes it seems to take 20. 
for things to actually permeate through. But there was, it, we were still very much concerned with, um, uh, with ease of use. I call it the cut and paste HCI. Right? Is, it, is it better to cut and paste this way than that way? And a lot of the early HCI was, was like that. Uh, but people like Tom Malone saw that there was something else that was coming. Um, and so on. The Apple Mac appeared in 84, um, and then, and so on. And at Loughborough, we started the first uh, of conferences in a series of creativity and cognition in 1993, bringing artists, designers, computer scientists, and so on together to talk about creativity, computing, uh, and interaction. That conference has now grown into a SIGCHI uh, conference series of some uh, size and quality. Um, here's the kind of things we talked about in the introduction to that conference. Talking about understanding creativity. The, the point behind this remark was really quite a standard HCI type of view, which is that the first thing you have to do, I used to always say this to my students in the first lecture when I did those kind of courses, the first thing is know something about the user. If you're wanting to support creativity, well, you have to understand something about creative process and creative people and so on. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, um, experience design was very much uh, something that has sort of grown recently, but it had its roots back in 94. I think this is well recognized as the first uh, real public statement that experience design was something we should worry about. That shift towards worrying about experience. And worrying about creative experience, well, in the second Creativity and Cognition Conference, we very optimistically said um, that Creativity supporting computer systems uh, is something now firmly on the research agenda. I think that was very hopeful. It was firmly in the footnote somewhere to get onto the agenda later. Uh, I think today, as you know very well through this uh, series of meetings, it is on the agenda. And that's the kind of shift we've been making. I want to just mention, as a plug really, this series of conferences now, the last two meetings have been in the US. The next one is in, um, going to be in uh, Georgia Tech in 2011. You can't probably read the bits at the bottom. But I've, I've highlighted here uh, the key information about a note at the bottom. Anyone who wants to be involved in, in the ACM Creativity and Cognition Conference in 2011, please email Nick at Queen Mary, uh, who will coordinate that, take note of volunteers, pass them on, and try to get you involved. And I say that because I think this is a very good uh, location in which to advertise that. Um, I have to tell you that getting into the conference, unfortunately, is getting difficult because the subject is getting popular. But it's still worth having a go, if possible. So, we've had the shift from ease of use to experience and creative experience. And after all, creative experience is surely at the heart of very much uh, a rewarding human activity. As you must realize, all professional work is creative. It's, it's almost by the nature of professional work that it's creative. So, creativity covers everything from play to professional work and other kinds of work too. So, it's absolutely fundamental and it's strange that in the early days we didn't take enough notice of it because it's so much more important than mundane, rigorous work. Of course, I'm more interested in it in terms of uh, art, aesthetics, and these kind of deeper qualities of life than work, but as I'll say to you, I believe um, we, we can see that there's a closer relationship between these, these things than people sometimes say. So, 
the point is that this is a, an arc of change in HCI and it hasn't finished. And what I want to talk about is like, where next? And I have to say that meetings like this are the right sort of places to think about it because the established, long established things, especially like the Kai type of conference, and I'm not talking about Kai in particular, but we have had some discussion about this at the very beginning of this conference, tends to become conservative. It's by the nature of such organizations that they do, okay, because they get structures and rules and procedures and so on. I think Kai is pretty good, actually, at moving with the times as such conferences go. But the slightly more informal events like this are places where it's sometimes easier to push the boundaries. Um, okay, I'm not actually going to tell you what the real future is, but I'm going to give you a progress report on the kind of things that we've been trying to do um, in Sydney and in pe with people I know. Um, well, what I've been trying to do is all around art and this started before I was in Sydney. Um, we, a whole group of us, were working on this subject in Loughborough in England before the Sydney thing. But uh, what I'm going to be talking about now is just the, this more recent stuff. Um, but when we started, we looked at these kind of questions. First of all, interactive art, which is, as you know very well, you're seeing it, hearing about it, uh, observing it at this very meeting, uh, it's increasingly important. Digital art is increasingly interactive. Um, the, the relationship between a game and an artwork is very blurred. There's edges here. Some games are really artworks, some artworks are kind of very much like games and so on. And so a lot of the notions that we have about game experience is also relevant to art experience. And much of it is intended to engage the audience in some form of interactive experience. And uh, aesthetic experience is part of that. So it's interactive art seems to fall very much into this ACI kind of world. Um, and we can learn from art because art is a kind of extreme case. Artists are difficult, actually, and very demanding. And they, they represent a kind of boundary condition for creative uh, requirements for, for the uh, activity of being creative. And any good physicist will tell you that the best thing to do when you're studying, when you're a scientist, is to study the boundary conditions. If you go to the average, then the differences get kind of rather blurred. If you go to the edge, that's when you really show up the key issues which you then look back into the average and, and illuminates what goes on sort of ordinarily. And so I argue, uh, very, and I'm very convinced about this, that actually looking at art, looking at artists, tells us a lot about what's relevant to everyone okay. on that scientific approach that, as I say, is quite normal in science. In psychology, for example, uh, it's good to look at illusions. If you look at how we see the bottle, you know, that's what we want to know. But if we look at when there's a, a mistake, if you like, in our visual process because of some illusion or other, then that's often how we learn about the visual process in our brain. So that's kind of the um, And the emphasis in art is on experience and engagement rather than tasks and error rates and so on. So also it's kind of quite good because it's placing our attention where we want it to be. Okay, and it's kind of clear that that's the case. Um, Well-defined tasks are not really very interesting in the art context. And so that helps us. It doesn't mean to say that well-defined tasks are unimportant, but if we want to focus our attention on these new things, then we'd better try and make sure that we understand that we're not confusing them with the art. Um, and the consent, central concern in the art context is new forms, new contexts, new, new experiences. So it's kind of inventing new things. Um, 
And also, interaction uh, in the art world is very much related to concerns for perception. Much art is concerned with perception. Perceptual and cognitive processes are very much the subject of much art. Although it may not be said so on the outside, that's really what it's about. Challenging our understanding of the world, our perception of the world is what artists often do. Um, but the, and, and that's even, so, and, and it's even the case in very, very uh, traditional art. I'm not just talking about modern art. And perception is itself an active process. So it's quite a, quite a complex business about how we relate to the world, how we perceive the world. Even looking at something, it, the brain is working actively on it, even a static object. Um, and which led, for example, Marcel Duchamp to say that the spectator adds his contribution to the creative act. The artwork is only completed in that view by the audience being there. And of course, in an interactive work, that is even more so. So that's another point, that we no longer should look at the artifact. The artifact, whether it's a website or artwork, isn't really the point, because on its own, it doesn't sort of mean anything. It doesn't mean anything until you've got a person or some people interacting with it. And that's something that artists understand very well. Um, and in an interactive art, the interactive activity um, is actually something which we can observe. So that's helpful in terms of the agenda that I'm talking about, because we can look at it and we can try to understand it. Okay. For the core of what I want to say to you, I want to go into some examples now of some practice-based research concerned with interactive new digital art work and to show you some glimpse of where that is leading us towards this future uh, of new ways of looking at human computer interaction and the kind of research agenda that we have to set. Um, so I'm just going to take this from the work that's been going on uh, in my group, the Creativity and Cognition Studios. Um, in Sydney, uh, we're um, a group of people, it's largely a PhD program. Um, uh, and we conduct work across disciplines. So both the academics and the students come from many backgrounds. Some are, art, many in fact, are artists using digital technology. Some are technologists concerned to help creative practitioners with their work by developing new software environments and so on and so forth. Some are human factors experts trying to understand the creative process and so on. And it's by bringing these different disciplines together that we work in this way. Um, Linda Candy just sitting there is one of the other key members of the group and the one, one or two other people in the audience uh, know us and have visited us. Um, but I will just uh, show you one thing, which is, I mean, you have to come to one of our uh, tutorials. Uh, this is a picture taken in one of our tutorials, uh, which helps for creative thought. I think. Um, so the PhD program uh, is one that generates outputs. It's not just bringing people together from dis different disciplines, but it's equally important that you generate outputs to different disciplines. So we make art, we produce HCI results, we make designs and we produce design research results, uh, and we learn about creativity. So we show work in exhibitions of one kind or another, we publish in journals uh, like Design Study, we have special issues of like Design Studies, uh, Co-Design, um, and so on. Uh, and so on and so forth, uh, coming out of the work. So it's not just multiple inputs, it's multiple outputs, and I believe that's a crucial point to understand in terms of the future too. I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, and in fact, I'm really, for the purpose of this talk, just want to concentrate on this ACI part of it. So um, 
I could go along any of these other arrows at this point, but I'll go along that path for the remaining time uh, I'm allowed. Um, and before I go into some examples, I just want to make a couple of um, points, which is, um, first of all, there's a word, evaluation, which is very important to everything we do. I don't know, uh, talking to people here, not everyone puts as much emphasis on that word as I wish to. Um, so I thought I should say something about it. Evaluation as part of a research program is like finding out the answers to questions. Like, you have this idea, I want to do this and the other, and I build this thing, and I want to know, does it work? Well, I have to find out whether it works somehow. Let's call that evaluation. I have some expectations. Um, are those expectations met? I have the expectation that people will want to look at this. Well, do they? I have some expectation that it's fun. Well, do people find it fun? You know, I need to know these. Now, I'm not talking here about evaluation in the art context of like, is it great art or not? Which is an interesting question, but that isn't what I'm talking about. I'm saying we have research goals. The artist has goals about their work, about how the audience will engage with it, whether they'll bother with it or whatever it is they'll do. And we want to know, in the research context, do they do it? But of course it goes on to that. Any designer will want to know, you know, is it on budget? Any of these questions require some evaluation. That's to say, collect some data and analyse it somehow and see. It doesn't mean to say, and I'm not talking about necessarily doing experiments, it can be highly qualitative, but it, and it's often like just interviewing people or something like that, but it needs to be done. So evaluation is a very important part of this. And the other part that I want to make is that, of course, the kind of research I'm talking about here, and the way I believe the future has to be set, especially in the context of our discussions over the last few days, uh, is in a practice-based concept of research, where you bring together theory and practice. Um, and um, we're very concerned with that and we've been working with that. Leonardo, Leonardo Journal is about to publish a paper that Linda and I wrote summarising what we've been doing about theory and practice uh, in, in recent years using some of these PhD examples. And I don't have time to go through this in detail, but just to show you, I'm just saying that this is something we seriously need to worry about. The, the left-hand diagram there is saying that there are three top-level things that we need to worry about. One is practice, you know, designing stuff, uh, making artworks, and so on. Uh, another is theory, the theoretical basis of that work, or the theories that come out of that work. And the third is the evaluation, like how you find out whether those things relate to one another the way you thought they did or not. Okay. Um, and people can set their research program to go through, go through this in many, many, many different paths. There is no set way to do it. And on the right, uh, this is just a picture taken out of the paper. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of somebody's work where the practice drove the theory. Okay, so in, in, uh, I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through this properly, but basically the, the idea here being that through practice there uh, becomes advance in theory. Okay. It can be, on the other hand, someone else might go through this in a different path where the theory drives the practice or, or, or some other combination. Um, and so um, the practice leads essentially to works of some kind or another. The theory leads to frameworks of one kind or another. And those frameworks may be things that can be used uh, to set agendas and to help study uh, work in the future. And in a way, that's what this talk is going to end up being about. And evaluation leads to kind of results of one kind or another, findings uh, to tell us things about what actually happens in, in the world. 
Um, I, okay, so, you know, and we publish on this in all kinds of ways. The, um, the second paper listed there is one that's about uh, what I've just said. Um, uh, the third one is about how artists fit into the research process. And the, fourth one, it, the third and the fourth one there both came out of a UK network we collaborated with called the Creator Network, which is based from Nottingham University. Um, we did a lot of work with it recently. Um, and so uh, you can go to our website and see all the, this kind of stuff. But now, I want now um, to go through just four quick examples and I'll show you something about the work of these examples. If you know our work or you've heard me talk about this before or you've been to our website, you'll know a bit of this. But I want to emphasize in each case a slightly different point to anything that I hope you have quite taken in before. So Bridget recently completed a PhD. She is an artist um, and she'll let her explain her own work. whilst I was on exchange in Japan working with um, Dr. Kazushi Shimoto, who um, is affiliated with CCS. He works at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Kanazawa. Sprung was created in response to an earlier work called Elysian Fields. That work was using a floor pad system and had an animated abstract field of grass. And one thing I noticed as people walked around it was that they tended to stop their feet even though the, the amount of pressure that they were putting on the pads didn't actually affect the work at all. I was kind of interested about the way that the representation of the grass being stomped affected the behaviour of the participants. And so I designed this work with springs to see if I could get people to use this, using the same floor pads to actually jump and spring about instead of doing that kind of stomping behaviour. Both of these works then led me on to develop my central research question, which is looking at the relationship between um, the types of gestural interactions that people might do within an interactive work and then the ways that those gestural interactions are represented within the actual work and how I can design those two elements so as to stimulate people to actually play creatively. The methodology I'm using is this is a practice-based art research project. I'm creating a series of various artworks. I also see the stimulation of creative play as being useful within an educational context. A lot of current research is looking at games and gaming and that type of behaviour and observing the way that people when they play games are able to learn an awful lot of skills in without almost realising that they're doing so, so in a fun and um, exciting and engaged manner. So being able to stimulate playful behaviour is something that could potentially be used within the educational industry as well. And out of this work, by looking at the theory and by making these works and evaluating them, I'll say more about how Bridget evaluated them in a few moments, came a realisation that there are lots of different ways in which people can get pleasure in play or can experience in play. And here's a list uh, of, of some of these. These are probably the main ones. And it's quite interesting. Um, very different things here, like from fantasy situations and danger situations, okay? So there are, the point being here that when one is making an artwork, or a game come to that, uh, one actually needs to pay attention to which of these things, one or more of these uh, kinds of experience, one is actually going for. 
And depending which one, it needs to be designed differently. So these are very explicit issues that we need to understand and make decisions about. And when we're evaluating uh, an interactive system, we need to evaluate it clearly against whichever of these categories we want to pay attention to. Or we may need to evaluate it and discover which kind of interactive experience is being involved here. Here's a lot of people have worked on this in relation to pleasure, and uh, you might want to go through this now, but here's a map that Bridget drew of different people's research and how it maps into these different categories uh, for this framework. So here we have a kind of framework coming out in that context. Um, uh, another researcher who recently completed a PhD is Andrew Johnston. He's actually a professional musician. In his former life, he played uh, trombone in uh, national orchestras in Australia. Uh, um, and recently, he's done work on the relationship uh, between uh, creative exploration by musicians uh, with the computer systems and their own uh, creative lives in various ways, which he can explain better himself. In my PhD, I'm examining the development of interactive software for musicians. And the basic research question is um, can using computers to visualize and transform musical performance enhance performers' understanding of their playing and encourage creative exploration? Andrew's quite modest because 
an uh, important outcome has been these uh, interactive artworks where the interaction has been between expert musicians and the, and the computer-based system, which has led to performances in places like the Sydney Opera House, for example. So uh, he's been learning things about interaction, but also making important <coughs> artworks. And um, one of the things that I particularly wanted to mention that came out of this was these different categories of engagement between the expert musician and the work. And so this is another sort of list of issues that we need to start to worry about. So um, briefly, the three categories are instrumental, ornamental, and conversational that seem to be the most important ones. Instrumental means that the musician was kind of like playing it as if it was an instrument, as we've seen uh, in performances here, that kind of thing. Uh, secondly, uh, ornamentally, so that the person would be playing their instrument, but that the visuals and the... Uh, sound stuff that came from the system would augment it. So, so it would be kind of like some decorative stuff around the core. And thirdly, conversational, where they what they played was actually influenced by what they saw. And what they saw was influenced by what they played. So you kind of got a conversation going, which was an interesting thing. And uh, just to mention, uh, this was he was the one where he was doing theory uh, based on practice that I mentioned. Earlier. Okay, uh, I need to kind of rush through a little bit, but uh, briefly uh, on a couple more points here. There's art and experience design um, has become quite a big issue, and one of the issues is that when you're making an interactive artwork, you haven't got anything until you've got an audience, and you don't have an audience in a studio or a laboratory or something. You need that audience in a kind of real situation. Um, and what, why, why do you need to do that? Because you need to understand something about uh, engagement and the kind of engagement that, that your public is having. And so we've also started to classify different kinds of engagement, uh, ranging from like, are you attracted to it, which is something like people in museums are very interested in. They talk about attractors. Um, in museum studies, you'll see that kind of stuff discussed a lot. Sustainability, like having looked at it, do you then just walk on? Or do you now become engaged and spend half an hour with it or two minutes or whatever? And then do you form longer relationships? And so, And the, the nature of the design of the interaction needs to be different for these different forms of engagement. So these are important material issues to worry about. Um, uh, Lizzie Muller has been working on this, and she'll say something important here about My name's Lizzie Muller, the approach. And that we've I'm used. a PhD researcher with the Creativity and Cognition Studios here at University of Technology in Sydney. My particular area of research is the audience experience of interactive art. Um, previously, back in the UK, I worked as a curator and as a producer of many different kinds of artwork, but particularly art that interacted with science in some way. During that time, I became really interested in audiences and the really interesting ways in which they interacted with new and emerging kinds of art forms like new media art and digital art. I became particularly interested in human-computer interaction and also in the lack of knowledge that curators had about how to stage interactive art, how audiences would react to it, and how to get the best kind of results out of interactive artworks. So I decided that it would be good to do a little bit more research on this topic. I wanted to actually put works on in a public space and start to come to understand how audiences interacted with them. And out of that rationale, this initiative, which is called Beta Space, developed. Beta Space is a kind of experimental exhibition environment here in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. It's a space where artists can show artwork during the course of its production and where we can have access to a broad range of audiences to understand their experience of the artwork that we show here in more detail. So currently we're showing Time Sketches by an artist called Andy Pallain. Time Sketches um, is a very simple work that explores the idea of your image over time. Andy's particularly interested in um, the idea of play and how play works in interactive artwork. So he's created this very simple duo. This piece is called Time Smear, and this piece over here is called Time Slicer. And what he's trying to do is to explore the very basic elements that are needed by people to start to interact intuitively with an artwork in the space. During the course of my research, I've worked closely with some artists, refining and developing their artworks and using the exhibition space as a kind of a laboratory. 
My particular artwork is Cardiomorphology, it's by artist George Kitt. This is your heart sensor, that's your palm, that's your fingers. And the same on the other side. So in a minute you're going to start to see the screen picking up your heartbeat, and you'll see the patterns start to change with your heart rate. The smaller, redder, more intense patterns show that your heart rate slowing down, and the larger, green and yellow patterns show that your heart rate speeding up. And what tends to happen is, as you breathe in, your heart rate will speed up, and as you breathe out, your heart rate will slow down. Um, the first two people I showed you are artists, essentially, creative people. So the viewpoint in which they did their work and did their evaluation was the viewpoint from the creative practitioner. Uh, Lizzie is a curator, and she took a curator's viewpoint, which is different again, because it's like bringing the audience together with the work. Um, and there are other viewpoints. I'm about to show you some, a viewpoint from a researcher, human factors design researcher, and then you can have a technological viewpoint. And depending which viewpoint you take, uh, we, we need to know what, what methods to use, because a different viewpoint means different questions and a different priority list, and that means different research methods. So all these issues are also very important to understand. Um, so uh, Zaffa, uh, he can explain himself too, he, uh, he's been asking questions like these, uh, these are kind of more but kind of obvious research questions, and he is a researcher, that's why, but he's doing the same kind of thing, looking at the same kind of works uh, in the same kind of context, but from a different viewpoint. So I'll let him say a few words about this. Recently I had finished my PhD in, at the University of Sydney in the Department of Architecture and Design Science. And my current position at the Creative Thinker Mission Studios, I have been studying the audience experience of interactive artworks in a public, or public exhibition context. In the design context, we use protocol analysis um, as a way to analyze architects' behaviors and verbal explanations of what they do. And in the better space context, when the audiences um, talk about their primary experiences. We try to code every word they say and what emotions they had, what states they were in, what they were thinking during the experience, and what goals they have set out for themselves. And in this work, um, Zafa has identified overstudying about 20 such situations in the exhibition space. Um, various phases of interaction, so that it's not just that like, someone interacts with something in this way, there it is. It's not like that at all, it develops over time. So um, he's turned these, I'm, I don't have time to explain them in detail, but he's turned them um, adaptation, learning, anticipation, leading to deeper understanding. It's fairly obvious really that people evolve and develop and adapt and so the whole processes do as well. So there isn't just a single snapshot that you can take which tells you about interaction. Okay. So in HCI, I'll use the phrase once, interaction design, uh, there's no good just thinking that you design for one context. With one person you'll get different contexts because you go through these phases. And that's what we see. And uh, here's a not very good picture. But what we see is that people, when they first come to an interactive artwork, uh, are in a very kind of exploratory, they don't know anything about it, they don't know what it's for or what it's about, and so on and so forth. And as they interact with it, their relationship with that work changes. Their form of engagement in changes, the depth of engagement in changes. Change may go up or down or whatever, but the whole relationship shifts. Um, and, well, I am really going to skip a couple of slides here, but basically that means that another issue that we need to think about is whether the system, the artwork, should shift as well. And so we're also starting to work on the notion of artworks that change over time, taking into account these kinds of changing situations. Um, so, summing up and now trying to come to the, what I've 
been leading up to in all this uh, discussion, is that what do we see out of these studies, these practice-based studies of interactive art production and use and so on? We start to get taxonomies of different kinds of experience. We start to get taxonomies of different kinds of engagement. And from this, we start to develop design criteria and evaluation criteria, which are valuable to the designers and the artists. And we start also to get some critical analysis. In fact, interactive art, for those of you in the art world, will, uh, I'm sure those people will certainly agree with me, that the critical analysis of interactive art is very difficult today. We don't really have a language. We're not very good at it. Okay. Renaissance art is very easy, but... You know, interactive art is very difficult. And actually, another thing out of this is, is that. And these taxonomies and criteria are ones that are new to HCI, which is the most important point. So, first of all, by drawing from HCI psychology and so on, we can begin to develop a critical language. That's one thing that's good. The list of issues, that's the beginnings of a language in which we can really discuss uh, the, the important characteristics of these interactive works. And so the research into interactive art contributes to the study of creative interaction and audience engagement. And to go back to a point I made much earlier, the, what this offers is not just to art, not even just to games, but it's to every interactive experience. It's something we ought to look at and learn from how we might design something which is a, a website for booking holidays. Okay, Even there you can learn from this work about engagement and experience that can be supportive of making those kind of things good. So the question is, is this the basis for the next HCI vocabulary? And I think it is. And here's my quick take as I conclude about what we should be looking at. So here's kind of like the progress report says the answer is going to look something like this, which as far as I'm prepared to say today. But there are key issues that we need to address that our research should be answering, which are what kinds of experience can we identify and what kinds of experience do we need to know about, be able to design for, be able to evaluate about? What modes of engagement matter? It's no good just saying, is someone engaged or not? It's a much more complicated business than that. What, what are the modes of engagement that matter? What phase of involvement in, in an interaction process are we talking about? And this relates something people always used to say in the old days, it's not just ease of use, it's also ease of learning. And sometimes if, for example, it's the control room of a nuclear submarine, the ease of use uh, is maybe important, but you have to take into account that the ease of learning is not the same as the ease of learning required for a computer game. Because you can give a submarine commander a year's training before he can actually get to it, and then it's got to be easy, easy to use once he's had that year's training. Whereas for a computer game, someone has to be able to use it like, as they walk up to it, or else they'll never buy it. So, uh, this isn't altogether new, but it's, something, it's a new focus, I think. And the viewpoint of evaluation, again, uh, there are lots of different players, stakeholders here, and we have to understand which stakeholder we're talking about, which viewpoint to have. And then we can kind of draw graphs or, or do taxonomies, you know, engagement against the phase, for example. Um, and there's no answer here. This is just ways of thinking about what it is that we're trying to do. Okay. Um, engagement against experience. What kind of engagement for what kind of experience? These are questions that we need to ask. And the vocabulary itself, well, I've started to throw at you new uh, kind of words, and I believe that these words... Uh, we can say much more, and you can draw out of what I've said more detail than this slide shows. Um, but these are words that ought to be in our vocabulary, and we ought to be writing about, being clear about, in, in, in the things that we design, 
the things that we evaluate and the research that we do. For example, experience. Are we talking about a creative kind of experience, an exploratory experience, uh, a difficult experience? Is difficulty a key issue uh, here? And difficulty can be good. Crossword puzzles, you know. I don't do that crossword puzzle because it's too easy. Uh, it's, you know, sort of thing. Uh, engagement, uh, is it what kind of engagement are we talking about? Um, what kind of phase are we in? And what kind of viewpoint? Is it the artist, is it the designer? And they're different, by the way. The artist's viewpoint is different to the designer's, but also even more so the researcher or the technologist and so on. So um, here we see the kind of vocabulary that we ought to be talking about. Uh, you don't see task there, you don't see error. Those words are the, are the old words, which have their place, uh, but we know a lot about that, but I'm, I'm advocating the new kind of focus for the future research in HCI should be something like this. Um, the art of interaction is what I've been talking about. That's my shorthand for saying practice-based research in interactive art informing this future agenda, you might say, or the future understanding of what it is that we need to worry about in HCI, and here, let's say, interaction design research. Um, if you want to know more about the kind of work that I've mentioned, that's the URL of our group, Creativity and Cognition Research Studios, and that's my personal URL too. And I've used up my time, but I will be willing to answer a question or so if you have time. Back, it's like, it, was there anything generic about the way that artists did their evaluation and went through that um, framework that I put up? And the answer is not really, but the reason for the framework is that was what was generic about it. So the generic thing is they're all concerned with these different issues to do with theory, practice, and evaluation, and that came rigidly the case. So the issues are pretty generic. But the paths, the way that they move around it, isn't. Um, and I couldn't see any reason why it needed to be. Um, it, it's just like what your focus of attention is. Um, and, and so the reason that we kind of came up with this framework was indeed to try to, to connect this work to this work, which seemed to be very different. But when you look at it this way, you find it isn't that different. It's just that this person is going that route and this person is going on another route, around the same map. And so we had to lift it to that level, if you like, to see the general. Yes, sir. Um, you, you talked specifically about the adaptability of these works being extremely important and the way they change over time. What does that mean for archiving? Or if you want to make, say, a museum with a permanent exhibition, it's going to be a real problem for something. Um, quick answer is a nightmare. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, it's the same for all performance art, for example. Um, it's, it's a hot, top, hot topic, actually, in, the, in this world, as you may be aware. Um, and I, I, I think that, to put the question slightly differently, the question is, if experience is the crucial point and experience is changing, how do you archive that or how do you recover what that, what that was? And I think that the answer seems to be to, uh, to try to record not just the work, again, in the, in the archiving, not just to archive the objects. If you archive the objects, which is nice, but you get like bits of paper and like something like which 
which actually used to be a piston in something that moved, but now it's, you can just look at it and you get all that. But you naturally need to have like interviews with people recorded and so on. Like, what did you feel about this? What happened when you did it? So uh, you start to use those different kinds of archiving methods, which, which are, are well known, of course, in other contexts. But that, that kind of historical studies where people do studies of you know, village life, and you record interviews with the old people about what they used to know and stuff like that. And you need to use those kind of methods, I think, in, in this kind of uh, archiving of, of art. So, but, it's, but it's a real difficult problem, it's a current research problem, which I know many uh, museums and, and historical groups around the world are really worried about and are trying to, to wrestle with. One more quick question. Is, yeah, just through the framework of the theory of practice evaluation, is it something that you can consciously, or PhD students would consciously use to navigate a pathway through the PhD, or is it really only a bit doable in retrospect, looking back on what they've achieved and trying to map it onto that uh, process? I believe it's something that they can and should use to uh, upfront, really, but. Uh, it comes out of a retrospective analysis of some work uh, and then it's passed on to the next generation, if you like, to say now you've got a, a leg up because because now you can use this to begin with and start to, to negotiate. I mean, like all planning, of course, you change your mind. That's what planning is all about. But at least you've got a starting point and you say, okay, I think I'm going to go like this way. And that helps to... Um, pin down the PhD process, which of course is very difficult in this area because it's, you know, experimental uh, chemistry or something is kind of so well defined and our area isn't. So anything you can do like this that helps the student is good news. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for being again. <laughs> Next we have uh, Kai Kashagu here. <laughs> right, uh, we're talking about real and virtual environment. Just before you get going, 